All righty. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, welcome to Hillview this morning. Um, there is one uh, housekeeping item that uh, I've been asked to address um, just before we start. Um, apparently, places of worship are exempt from the mask rule, so you are free to take it off. Um, if you would like to keep it on, that is, you are absolutely free to do that. Uh, and yeah, don't feel pressured or anything. But uh, as far as we know, uh, we, we're exempt. So that is uh, uh, good. And it's good for me because I like to see your faces when you sing. Um, it's a bit hard to, to lead worship with all of our faces covered up. So um, yeah, we, uh, we're here to worship God this morning. Um, we like to start with a call to worship because God is the one who calls us in. So let's uh, just listen to the words in Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in the desert, in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. Uh, they were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Amen. That's the word of the Lord. When we come and worship together, that, that's what we do. We proclaim the story of God. Um, there, there's one song uh, that we're singing this morning that talks about um, this is our story um, because it's God's story and he has invited us in. Um, uh, let, let's, uh, let's come to God in prayer. Um, dear Lord, thank you for inviting us into this place where we can worship you. Um, I just ask that you would um, you would make yourself known to us. Um, just have your, your presence abide with us and in us. Um, let, let us worship you in a way that is pleasing uh, to you. Um, we pray this in your name. Amen. Let's uh, stand together and sing some songs to God, just in thankfulness of all that he has done. You've come to bring peace, to be love, to be nearer to us. And you've come to bring life, to be light, to shine brighter in us. So we man you well, God with us. Oh, Deliverer, you are Savior, in your presence we find our strength, over everything, our redemption, God, with us, you are God, with us, you've come to be whole. To this world for your honor and you've come to take sin to bear shame and to conquer the grave oh we met you well God with us our deliverer you are Savior, in your presence we find our strength, over everything, our redemption, God, with us, you are God, with us. You are here. You are holy, we are standing in your glory. 
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy and whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. That's the blessings of God to be uh, in his presence and praising our Savior for all of our days. Amen. You are free to be seated. not because it has any innate power, but because you've brought us into relationship with yourself and told us to pray. We acknowledge it's not the act of prayer that does any good, but the object of our prayer. And we get to pray to you. We don't pray to a cold and impersonal universe. We don't plead the favor of petty little deities. We don't try to arrange karma so it benefits us instead of harms us. We speak to a loving Father who created the universe and has created us and began a relationship with us. You tell us that as our Father, you love to hear from your children. You tell us you love to act on our prayers and act through our prayers. And to this end, we are truly humbled and grateful. Father, help us to live as if prayer really matters. 
Liberate us to worship as if prayer really matters. Give us strength that we might not grow weary in this task. Let us believe that often the best thing we can do is not act first, but pray first. Lord, let prayer be our first instinct rather than our last resort. Let it be instrumental rather than supplemental to all we do and all we are. Father, make us into a praying church. First on Sunday as we gather together in corporate worship and then through the week as we meet with friends and as we have times of personal devotion. Please, Jesus, help us to pray. Help us make a priority of prayer and help us to see and celebrate answers to prayer. Give us confidence that our prayers matter, not because we found just the right formula and not because we've said just the right words, but because we know God and because we are known by God. Let us pray boldly. Let us pray confidently. Let us pray constantly. Let us storm the gates of heaven through prayer and let us pray until the day of your glorious return. Come, Lord Jesus, come. All the while, let us be thankful for the precious gift that you've given us in prayer. Holy Spirit, we thank you for each person you've brought here this morning. We thank you that you continue to add to our number. I'm especially aware this week of those individuals and families who are new to Canada. Lord, we love to live in a city that has invited the world to join us. We love to see in this church such a sweet picture of what you're accomplishing in this world by drawing people from all over the globe into your family. I pray that these people who are new to Canada would adjust well. I pray that they would come to love this country and come to thrive here and come to play a key role in your heavenly kingdom right here and in their new nation. I pray that you would comfort them as most have left family and friends behind and I pray that their relationships with Christians here would be deep and meaningful. I pray that we, as their brothers and sisters, would welcome them in the name of our common Savior. And for them and others who are new to this church, I pray that they would join into the life of this church and become members and deploy their gifts and talents right here for the good of your people and the glory of your name. Lord, you have called upon us to offer to you our prayers of intercession and supplication. So we do just that this morning. We would pray that uh, your hand would be upon our nation and our city as we prepare to engage in a federal and municipal election. Lord, uh, we read in your word that uh, rulers only hold their seats, their place by your decree. And so we would humbly ask, Lord, that you would move in the hearts and the minds of Canadians and Edmontonians, that the people that we put in positions of leadership over us would have the mind and the heart of God. This would be our prayer. Father, this morning we think of our church planting missionaries in New Jersey, Rahim and Danielle Bango, and pray for your blessing over abounding faith Christian fellowship. Lord, we lift up our sister churches, Leduc Fellowship and South Fork, and um, I pray your, pray your hand of anointing would truly rest upon Dustin and all the staff at uh, LFC, and Lord, I see that uh, South Fork has an interim uh, Pastor Mike Conway, I don't know who Mike is, but I pray your blessing would rest upon him as he leads your people there. Father, we, uh, we lift up Veronica McKenzie before you today and pray that uh, you would grant her peace and grace and strength as she seeks to balance um, returning to Nate and her work and her ministry here as the director of social media. We thank you that she was able to celebrate a birthday yesterday and I can only imagine the joy that her parents felt the day that, uh, that you brought her into this world. Lord, may you bless her, be kind to her, be gracious to her, and may she experience your love, your peace, and your joy each and every day. Lift up 
my brother and sister Bob and Rosalie, and specifically their friend Brad. Give them wisdom to know how to minister to Brad and his family. We think of John and Uma's son Clive, and um, we know that his surgery has been bumped again to the middle of September. Father, I pray that, uh, that it wouldn't get bumped again. Lord, um, bring healing to, uh, to your servant Clive. Father, I pray for those uh, in this church who seek to actively minister to the community through the ministries of the Food Bank Initiative, the Counseling Service, the Reading Program at Hillview Elementary, and the upcoming plan to distribute Bibles. Lord, we need wisdom in these tasks, and so we pray for the grace and the ministry of your Holy Spirit in us and amongst us, that we would be wise to these ends. And for all of the ministries within the church in this upcoming new ministry year, Lord, I pray that you, t you would inspire and evoke volunteers, lay people to come forth and participate in discipling ministries that would lead us all deeper into a loving relationship with you and um, a deeper commitment, I suppose, May your kingdom come. O oh, holy God, three in one. Lord, I want to thank you again for this day and for the opportunity to worship you right here and right now. And Lord, it is my prayer that during this time that we have together that we would, able to, we would be able to set aside the concerns of daily life for a while, that we would be able to be fully present here and and now in our minds and our hearts, because Lord, you know, you know that we are easily distracted. Help us to focus on you and your goodness and your glory. Lord, I pray that we'd be able to be still and know that you are God. And Father, as always, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy. There's two selected passages uh, that I'm going to read uh, for you and with you this morning. Um, and, uh, and then we are going to, uh, to see a video update from Nathan Risch. I should have prayed for Nathan. I was remiss. Um, Nathan has been in the hospital this past week. He's been diagnosed with diverticulitis. Um, he, uh, he was given antibiotics and painkillers, and uh, he was sent home yesterday. But Nathan is doing an incredible work in the city of Moose Jaw through Youth for Christ. And, uh, and so if you can, make a note of that, please, and uh, remember to pray for Nathan in the coming days and weeks. Deuteronomy chapter 33. Um, I'm going to read verse 1 and then pa the passage... 2 to 5, and then 26 to 29. Deuteronomy 33. This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before his death. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. Surely it is you who love the people. All the holy ones are in your hand. At your feet they all bow down, and from you receive instruction. The law that Moses gave us, the possession of the assembly of Jacob. He was king over Jeshurun, when the leaders of the people assembled along with the tribes of Israel. Deuteronomy 26 to 29, pardon me, 33 verses 26 to 29. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will drive out your enemies before you saying, destroy them. So Israel will live in safety. Jacob will dwell secure in a land of grain and new wine where the heavens drop dew. Blessed are you, Israel. Who is like you, a people saved by the Lord? He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you, and you will tread on their heights. 
So far, the reading of God's word. Al, would you please run that video? Good morning, Hillview. Really, really excited to be here with you to bring this update about Youth for Christ in Moose Jaw. For those of you that don't know, my name is Nathan, and my family and I have been ministering here with Youth for Christ for the past six years. And we're so thankful to you, um, Hillview, for supporting us, for encouraging us, and, and for your prayer, especially during this last year, during the pandemic. A uh, very difficult year, I know, for, for everybody, but we truly appreciate um, the role that you guys have played in encouraging us and supporting us through this time. Uh, we want to give you a quick update on what's happening this fall. We're really excited. We're going to be back in the high schools here in Moose Jaw. We're going to be at Central Collegiate, which we've been in. This will be our coming into our fifth year, I think, in the school. Uh, Peacock Collegiate, uh, we're going to be there. This will be our second year. And these are really exciting programs, a lot of fun. We weren't able to do it last year because of the pandemic. We'll be back this year. And so pray that God brings the students back out. We've got some connections already with kids there, but just really excited to be back in the schools doing our Alpha programs and, and bringing the love of Christ into the public schools here in, in Moose Jaw. So pray for that. We're also excited we're going to be launching our drop-in this year. Uh, this fall, we're at the painting stage right now in the Renos. We're partnering, uh, doing that with New Life Center, a church here in town. And we've got schools right close by, so we're going to be doing this junior high drop-in. Really excited about it. So pray for that. Pray we have good connections with those schools. Um, with the neighborhood and that the, the kids will come out and that we can just start pouring into their lives. So we'll be praying for that. And we have our youth group going still. We, we partner with another church here in Moose Jaw, Church of God Moose Jaw, to offer a youth ministry program. We do senior and junior high youth. We ran it all the way through the pandemic. And coming into the fall, we're excited because it's just it's grown so much. And looking forward to having all the students back in. We did a lot of fun stuff this summer with the students. And just looking forward again to, to starting back up, having new kids come in. And uh, continuing, we already have kids from our community programs connecting into the youth group. But we're excited to see more of those kids uh, coming from the community programs connecting into the youth group. And ultimately, the reason we do this is because we want to introduce uh, youth to Jesus and those that are already walking with him, we want to disciple them into a, an ever-deepening relationship with him. So thank you again for all your support. Thank you for your encouragement and thank you for your prayers. Uh, it means so much to us and just excited to see what God's going to continue to do uh, through this fall. And so thank you so much, Hillview. We love you guys. We hope the next time we can see you in person, person and we can see those brand new renos that are that are happening in the sanctuary. We're really looking forward to it. All right. We'll talk, talk to you later. later. Bye. Bye. Good morning, everyone. I don't know about you, but my heart is bursting forth from, from watching that and hearing what God is doing through that, that program. When we, we go out into the community, it's amazing what God does. Our New Testament reading is from Matthew 5. It's found in the Pew Bibles in 968 starting at verse 1, 968. The word of God as follows from the NIV version. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So far, the reading of God's word. Well, I, uh, I had a vacation, and as an old mentor of mine said, whenever you have a vacation, so does your congregation, but uh, we're all back to work, and uh, we're going to suffer through this sermon together. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully, it'll make sense to you. 
1966, the Beatles released a song called Eleanor Rigby. And it's a sad song about a lady who's lonely and she pines for the same happiness that other people experience. She's a church custodian who, according to some interpretations, is in love with the vicar, one Father Mackenzie, who experienced his own, his own form of loneliness. And ironically, these two keepers of the church, people of faith, presumably, never actually experienced the blessing of God. Eleanor Rigby opens with the line, all the lonely people, which is a marked contrast from the great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, in which the author describes many blessings which extol the grandeur of God and declares, blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. What, what is the difference between Eleanor Rigby and the person who wrote, Great is Thy Faithfulness? Or more to the point, what does it mean to be blessed. I even caught myself as we were praying, bless, bless, bless. And how easily and freely do we kick out that phrase? It almost becomes banal. That, that was for you. I used the word once in a sentence and Gabriella didn't let me forget it for three years. <laughs> when something becomes just ordinary, just ordinary, what constitutes a blessing? What do we mean when we say we are blessed? The definition of blessing as we find it in the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology is God's intention and desire to bless humanity, which is a central focus of his covenant relationships. For this reason, the concept of blessing pervades the biblical record. Two distinct ideas are present. First, a blessing was a public declaration of a favored status with God. Second, the blessing endowed the power for prosperity and success. In all cases, the blessing served as a guide and motivation to pursue a course of life within the blessing. Famous blessings in scripture include uh, Jacob stealing Esau's blessing, if you remember that. Jacob blessing his sons in Genesis 49. The ironic blessing, which we use as a benediction quite often in number six. And perhaps most notably, what Connor read for us this morning, the Beatitudes, as we find them in Matthew 5. And of course, the passage which we have before us today, Deuteronomy 33. So consequently, I think it behooves us to ask, what is significant about the blessing Moses pronounces over Israel in Deuteronomy 33? What is so significant about it? What makes it newsworthy? Well, first of all, it's out of place. By that I mean there's no grammatical or literary connection to what comes before it or after it. In fact, the content of the blessings to the various tribes makes many scholars think that it was written after the fact, as in four to five hundred years after the fact, and inserted here for various speculated reasons. A second peculiarity is that the tribes are not listed in birth order, but more in line with geographical boundaries. But perhaps the most notable nuance is that Simeon is missing. The popular opinion for this relates to the events of Genesis 34 where Levi and Simeon exact revenge for what happened to their sister, an act that was not commended by their father. And this brings us to the famous question, why does it seem like some people are more blessed than others? Levi becomes the tribe of priests and worship custodians. Simeon drifts into obscurity. But weren't they both guilty? Why do some people seem blessed and other people seem cursed? I think sometimes it just comes down to metrics, the way that we measure or, or evaluate what a blessing is. How or by what criteria do we decide what constitutes a blessing? I think sometimes it comes down to attitude. Some people are grateful for great and small things and see everything as a gift or a blessing from God. Some people expect nothing, so whatever they receive is a blessing. 
But some people expect everything to be handed to them on a silver platter, and when they don't get it, when they don't get what they want, they're disappointed, and sometimes they even become bitter. But sometimes it comes down to a lack of precision in our language, or understanding of what the Bible actually teaches on the matter. An example of this might be miracles. That is an abused and misused word. Um, Everything under the sun is a miracle, but... A miracle is actually a supernatural event in which something that ought not to happen happens. Like somebody walks on water, turns water into wine, or dies on a cross and comes back to life. And I know that there's beautiful, wonderful, and mysterious things. um, But, you know, so often we'll hear people say the birth of a child is a miracle. Well, not by the definition of what constitutes a miracle. Children have been born some seven billion times in the last few years. You know, we kind of expect it to happen. In fact, it's quite an affront to us when somebody isn't born healthy and happy, isn't it? We do the same thing with the word blessings. You know, oh, God bless you. Somebody sneezes. God bless you. Why do we say that? You know, it just goes way back into history where we think that, and this is kind of disgusting in some ways, that when somebody sneezes, they've blown out demons out of their nose and and we have to pronounce a blessing over them to slam the door shut so the demons don't come back. Um, That's that's really where it all comes from. You know, we're just, human beings are funny, aren't we? What is a blessing? What is a blessing? Let's examine our passage and ask, according to Deuteronomy 33, what are the true blessings of God? And I'd like to argue this morning that uh, the first of the true blessings of God is to be loved by God. Do you have that slide for us, Joy? To be loved by God. Look at verse 3. Yes, he loved his people. All his holy ones were in his hand. But you might be asking yourself right now, but doesn't God love everyone? Well, in reference to verse 3, the statement refers to the people with whom God was in covenant relationship with. When we read the book of Deuteronomy, it's important to keep the idea of covenant in view. Deuteronomy lays out all the various aspects of covenant and who's in. And by implication, who's not? The natural implication is that inclusion is not universal. Some people are on the outside. But that just doesn't seem fair to us, does it? That's not fair. How many times have children declared that? That's not fair. How many times have your parents punished you unfairly? Who can even begin to count? (laughs) We live in a culture that idealizes fairness and equality, and it's nothing new. If, uh, If you trace back to the United States, the FCC implemented the Fairness Doctrine in 1949 as a safeguard against propaganda. It was a policy that required the holders of broadcast licenses both to present controversial ideas of public importance and to do so in a manner that was honest, equitable, and balanced. That was actually repealed in 1987. And if you watch American news, you can see the effect of that today, (laughs) mind you. Should we throw stones because our own journalism seems a little wonky at times, doesn't it? We talk about leveling the playing field by ensuring that everyone has access to home field advantage. And yet, the team that finished higher in the standings gets at least one more game at home than the one that didn't. And I think that speaks to the reality that we're not all equal and life isn't always fair. And that's just the truth. You know, one of the things we always hear is that anybody can grow up to become president of the United States or prime minister of Canada. That's not true. That's not true. I mean, if you track backwards, you can say, oh, look at their humble beginnings. Anyone can become prime minister of Canada. But nope, that's not true. You need education. You need opportunity. You need to get introduced to the right people. You need to have connections, connections that not everybody has access to. Life isn't fair. I think we'd do so much better sometimes if we were just a little bit more realistic about that. 
Work hard, try your best, but sometimes things don't work out. Keep working hard, keep trying. Maybe one day something will break for you. But you know, when you come into the context of Scripture, we, we think, well, God's just got to treat everyone equally. If you read your Bible carefully, that actually doesn't happen. There's some people that got, get called to certain ministries, to certain tasks. There's some people that are put, in, put on thrones. There's some people that are called to usurp those who are put on thrones. What do we say then of God's love? Does it apply equally just to everyone? When you look at the relationship of covenant, if you look at Old Testament theology, if you look at the nation of Israel, we're confronted with some hard realities. I think one of the most difficult passages in Scripture is Romans 13, which refers back to Malachi chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Not everyone receives God's blessing. God does have enemies, and their fate is dire. Jesus speaks of a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you try to think through that picture for a moment of gnashing your teeth. It's not really a phrase we use that much anymore, is it? But can you see in your mind somebody who is in pain or anger to such a point that they are seething breath through their teeth. Perhaps it might be easier to think of the family pet who gnashes his teeth at you when you try to take away something that he's grown fond of. Jesus speaks of a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, and he speaks of a place of eternal fire, a place reserved for God's enemies, what we have come to know and describe in our vernacular as hell, a place of eternal torment. And in that, in the 20th century, especially the later part of the 20th century, there grew an idea that, well, all things will cease, including hell, and people who are in hell will just cease to be. But that really doesn't seem to honor what Jesus says about eternity, about eternal blessings, and about eternal damnation. When we accuse God of being unfair or unjust, we are exposing our ignorance. It's fair to say that we don't know the whole story, but God does. And this brings us back to the relationship between love and obedience and covenant. The stipulation of the covenant leading to blessing is love manifested through obedience. And, 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 and the math is pretty simple there, isn't it? If you love God, you'll obey God, you enter into covenant with God, and what holds you in that covenant with God is your faith, and faith is demonstrated by works. And so there's an interplay between love and obedience and faith and works. And are you saved by works? No, you're not saved by what you do. But what you do is often a demonstration of what you believe, of what you hold to be true. You know, don't actions speak louder than words? Don't they? And so when you come into this, you start to realize that for people who are resisting God, disobedient to God, disavowing God, living their lives in a way that is completely contrary to God's word, upon that day of judgment, what what are they to expect? For God to say, ah, God, it didn't matter. You know, I know that Jesus died on the cross and all that and the resurrection, but you know what, that's that's okay. I just just love everybody. God does love everybody, which is why he sent Jesus. But you know, at some point, the ball's in our court. We either respond or we ignore. We either accept or we reject But if you reject God, what is left to save you on that day of judgment? What? Would you not rather be a friend? Would you rather not be in a faith relationship with the Lord? Would you rather not understand and receive and experience the blessing of what it means to be loved by God? Because that is truly the first true blessing of God. And all of this leads us 
into the conversation of the next blessing if you drop down to verses 26 and the first part of verse 27. The second blessing is to experience God's presence. There is none like God, O Jeshurun, which was like a pet name for Israel, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. The eternal God is your dwelling place. And underneath are the everlasting arms. you've, You've realized that I've made a huge jump. Verses 26 to 25 take us through all the various blessings spoken over the various tribes, all but one of the tribes of Israel, which I mentioned before, Simeon. And then we come to this wrap up which in many ways refers back to verses 2 and 3. And the picture painted here impresses upon the reader the majesty of God as God, soaring through the heavens like an eagle with his angels in tow. And the picture has militaristic implications which are designed to depict the power of God as much as anything else. And more than that, this omnipotent, eternal God... This powerful, majestic vision of God. He's our, he's our dwelling place. And he holds us up. Underneath us are his everlasting arms. And he tells them to look into a future. It's, it's not even the land so much that sits in front of them that serves as their final destination. There's something more. What does it mean exactly to rest in God's everlasting arms? There's a famous picture of Jesus holding a lamb, and that's a picture I think we can insert ourselves into. E.H. Merrill describes it like this. He says, This lordly one, transcendently glorious as he is, also cares for those who know and trust him. He is their shelter, their hiding place, and also their safety net the God who holds them forever in his mighty arms. God's blessings are future and present. God dwells in the believer and with the believer. God is where we live, so to speak. And there we are, tucked in under under us are his wings, his arms. We are totally secure, totally protected from any spiritual or eternal harm which is my final point, the true blessing of God is to be under God's protection. Look at the second half of verse 27, verses 28 and 29. And he thrust out the enemy before you and he said, destroy. And verse 28, just underline that. So Israel lived in safety. So Israel lived in safety. Jacob lived alone in a land of grain and wine whose heavens dropped down dew. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help, and the sword of your triumph. Your enemies shall come fawning to you, and you shall tread upon their backs. For Israel to be able to fully appreciate the gift of the promised land, they must be able to dwell there feeling secure and assured of safety. Thus the imagery of the sword and the shield Old Testament scholar Edward Woods describes of theological history unfolding with shifting centers of gravity for all the tribes. But framing this blessing is the Lord who shines forth from Sinai as a king over Jeshurun in giving Israel the law. And finally, as warrior king who rides on the clouds of heaven and drives out the enemy from the land so that Israel might possess in it fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. God is, in essence, our knight in shining armor. I'm not a huge art fan, but uh, there's a picture I love. Uh, It's Raphael's St. George and the Dragon. But this is the picture that Scripture paints for us of God as essentially our knight in shining armor. He's he's our shield, our sword. He goes before us. He, He protects
ancient Near Eastern motif known to the Canaanites, but occurring also in the Old Testament. And you'll see that in Psalms 18, verse 10, and 68, verse 33, and a couple other references. You see the activity of God, the protection of God in the life of his servants and his people. I would refer you to 2 Kings chapter 6, where Elisha and his servant are surrounded by angels and his servant sees, sees the enemy before them and he's all worried and Elisha's not worried and like loose paraphrase, but the servant says, oh no, what are we going to do? And Elisha prays and says, God, open his eyes. And when he does, he sees the host of heaven. Daniel chapter 3, the angel that's, that's with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, which compels a confession of faith from Nebuchadnezzar. Or even if we go into Revelation 19 and we read about the rider on the white horse, it is God who goes before us. He is, he is our savior king. He is our warrior king. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And so if we stay confined within the parameters of Deuteronomy 33, to be truly blessed by God is to be loved experience the presence of God, and to live under the protection of God. That's the next slide there. One more. There we are. To be truly blessed by God is to be loved by God, experience the presence of God, and to live under the protection of God. All of these blessings are anchored in the sovereignty of God, who chooses who he loves, who he allows into his presence, and who he decides to shield and protect. It was God who elevated Simeon, just as he did in the case of Cain and Abel, just as he did in the case of Ishmael and Isaac, just as he did in the case of Esau and Jacob, just as he did in the case of Jacob and his brothers and Aaron and Moses, and the list goes on. In Genesis 49, 7, we read of Simeon and Levi, and the scriptures say, Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them, disperse them in Israel, and neither tribes inherit land. The tribe of Levi never gets any land. They get some cities, but they never get any land. And Simeon's portion is somehow assimilated into Judah's. And that's just incredible to think, isn't it? Because we're talking about something that happened back in, in Genesis 34. We're talking about something that's like 1,800 years before the birth of Christ. You think, you think your parents could hold a grudge? My mom could hold a grudge. She couldn't do 1,800 years. They're, they're not getting, they're not getting the blessing. And yet it's just so strange, isn't it? Because Levi becomes the tribe of priests and Levites, the custodians of worship. And what does Simeon get? You might think, how does God choose? But I would like to say this. Whatever happens in the economy of God, none of it's arbitrary. God explains clearly in Deuteronomy what the conditions of the covenant are. We know what God expects and demands of his people, which is to love God and to obey God and love your neighbor as yourself. And if love and obedience are tied together, if you're going to invert that for even a moment, if you're going to invert that for even a moment, then disobedience is akin to contempt. And disobedience is sin. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord, according to Hebrews 12:14. The only way that we can be in the presence of God is to be made holy. 
to have our sins washed away as the hymn writer queried and answered, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but what? The blood of Jesus, amen? And so loved by God and in the presence of God, we realize the third blessing, which is the protection of God. And here lies the biggest problem. For if God protects his people, then why did the Holocaust happen? If God loves and protects his people, how do you explain? What do you do with that? Why do bad things happen to innocent and vulnerable people? And herein rests the greatest demand on our faith to embrace the fact that we don't know the bigger picture, that we don't have all the facts, that we don't operate on the same grid that God does as it says in Isaiah 55 and verse 8, your ways are not my ways, your thoughts are not my thoughts. But to trust that everything happens for a reason, that God is just together to achieve what God decrees. And we don't know the whole story. We don't know what we've been shielded from sometimes, do we? Just like Elisha's servant, we can't see what we can't see, and we don't know what we don't know. This brings me back to Eleanor. Eleanor Rigby sought solace in the church, and by all indications, she never sought solace in God. She fixed her gaze on Father Mackenzie, who is just a man. And the song laments in the last verse when she died. No one was saved. Father Mackenzie couldn't save her. He, he can't even save himself. Salvation is found in Christ alone. Hence the call to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Material goods and good health are wonderful things, but if we're going to be honest, let's just, let's just acknowledge the fact that these are things enjoyed by many people irrespective of their spiritual convictions. The true blessings of God are to be loved by God, to live in his presence, protection. And the only way to receive these blessings is, into, is to enter into the new covenant mediated by Christ. When we confess our sins and put our faith in Christ to rescue us and redeem us from the dominion of sin and death, to be born again, washed anew as it were, then we become recipients of grace and the imputed righteousness of Christ, reconciled and restored children of God. God's love, God's presence, God's protection. These blessings if you choose so. Blessings all ours, with 10,000 beside. Amen. Let me pray for you, and as I do, Ben, would you come and your worship team as you prepare to lead us in our closing hymn. Father, oh, to be blessed by you, to know you, to be loved by you, to be in your presence to experience and enjoy your protection. Lord God, find us faithful. We have confessed and conferred and entrusted to all that we've entered into when we sought your forgiveness, confessed our sin, received grace and mercy, when we were made children of the living God. For to all who believed, to all received him, he gave the right to be called children of God. And perhaps ultimately in summation, Lord, this is the greatest blessing of all. Of the living, holy, and true God. Oh God, help us to be as faithful as you are. Hold us secure in your hand and lead us home. For I'd ask for this grace, this blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.
let's uh, rise and sing this last song. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. And so I bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Amen. 
God bless you all as you go in his name and his way and live your lives for his glory. Uh, just a quick, grab a seat for just a second. A couple of things I just want to talk about real, real briefly. Um, this is a long weekend, so we do not have a time of coffee fellowship today. Um, but the next couple weeks, we are going to be downstairs as the renovations happen. Now, you'll notice that in your pews, there's normally a hymnal and a Bible and other assorted paraphernalia. Is there any in the pew in front of you right now? No, because on Tuesday, the pews are all coming out. And is this right, Wes? The pews are coming out on Tuesday, and the carpet's coming when? We'll be removing the carpet on Friday. So it starts, hey? Yes. And are they going to start on the pews next week, too? Or this week, I guess? Is that this coming week? And then the carpet comes back in, and then the pews will start coming back in. And what we're hoping will happen is that this will all be done by September 25th so that we can worship together on September 26th. It might not be happen that way though. Is that right? In case it doesn't, we'll be downstairs for one more week. But that week, the 26th, we're having our Super Sunday, a very, very clever play on words because we're going we're gonna to have soup. Um, I know, right? Just, I may have stolen it from another church. I don't know. <laughs> I have these flashes of brilliance, and then I see it advertised other places, and I think, was I first or were they first? <laughs> um, but we are. We're going we're gonna to have soup and sandwiches, and we're going to have a program afterwards in which we introduce uh, the various leaders in the church, the various ministries of the church, and kind of explain all that. And then uh, we are looking over the membership list, and we've had quite a few new members over the last year, two, three, and uh, we thought, you know, it might be a good idea just to have a half day somewhere, maybe in October or early November, where we have um, kind of a seminar workshop type of thing, a new members class, even if you've been a member for two, three, four years. If you're sitting there wondering, okay, how does this church work? We'd like to just, uh, you know, invite you to come for coffee and muffins and some fresh fruit, and we'll have, a, we'll have one or two coffee breaks therein, but we'll will explain to the best of our ability um, the, the, the major branches of the church and how things work. So we're going to talk about the elders and what do the elders do and what are those responsibilities and who are the elders. And you'll meet them on the 26th, but you'll meet them again that day when we host it. We, don't, we do not have a date for that yet, but want to talk about that. Um, finances, we're going to explain just kind of um, how the budget is structured, what the philosophy of the budget is, what the mission's budget is, who the missionaries are, who and what and why we support what we do, um, and then um, various other ministries. And one of the big things that we're really, really working on is um, how, do we, how do we have a positive, God-honoring, God-glorifying impact in our neighborhood? And that began pre-COVID, that began with this reading program, and we had, I think, about half a dozen or so volunteers going to Hillview Elementary School and simply reading with children who were struggling with their ability to read and to mentor them in math or science or whatnot. Well, I think it was just math, but, um, but to read with the children and, and that sort of thing. And... Um, one of the things that came up in conversation, and um, it, it's kind of like an evolutionary process, but, you know, somebody came with an idea and said, why don't we have, like, a, a kitchen, like a, like a pantry, where people, if they need food, they can come and get food, or, you know, people can come and leave food, and we, we started talking about all of that, and, and the conversation's been growing and uh, the deacons have met with the food bank, the Edmonton Food Bank, and we might be able to enter into a relationship with the food bank. Um, and, uh, and we're exploring what all of that would look like and, and how would we, we go about doing that. 
and we've talked to the Gideons about distributing Bibles and going forth in the neighborhood and just sharing the Word of God, the love of God with people in the area. On October 2nd, I believe it's October 2nd, um, we're hosting the big bin event for commu our Woodvale Community League, and our church sits in the Woodvale Community, and so we're partnering with Woodvale Community League to, to, uh, to be a blessing to the neighborhood. And, uh, and I got to say, in case you're not aware, last year, Woodvale Community League went to all the churches in Woodvale and said, we have extra money. Whatever you donate towards Christmas relief for poor people, we'll match it dollar for dollar. And they did. And uh, it's, it's just such a great opportunity to to just be missionaries in our, no, our own neighborhood. You know, um, we've, we've all heard those, those lines about you, you got to crawl before you can walk, you got to walk before you can run. Well, you know, we, we've sent out a missions team to Brazil, but what does it say of us if we can travel halfway around the world to minister to people, but we can't minister to people who live across the street? Um, you know, we want to focus on the people who live across the street. Um, they need Jesus too, don't they? And, and so all these things are happening, and these are things that we want to explain and, and explore. And, you know, um, somebody gave me a great idea of something to do for Christmas, and so I asked him into, to look into the logistics of doing that. But, you know, this church is alive. It's growing. And I, I really trust and believe that you're growing in your faith because of what I see happening in your lives. It's a strange thing in so many ways to preach a sermon like the one I did this morning, because sometimes I just feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Um, because I do see a group of people who love Jesus, who are living out the word, who are doing their best to, to bring God honor and glory in their day-to-day -day lives. And do we fall short sometimes? You betcha. But you know what? Isn't grace great? Let's never presume upon it or take it for granted. But let's be grateful for the fact that God loves us, restores us, and keeps us moving forward as we... As we pursue him, he, uh, he also leads us. And uh, it's just a beautiful picture that unfolds in scripture to that end. So if you're wondering, what's this church doing? We'd like to have uh, a, a morning sometime this fall where we can explain everything that's going on. And, uh, and maybe, you know, if you've been scratching your head thinking, okay, how do things work around here? Um, you know, we... We're constantly under revision. It seems to be an ongoing process. Um, I'm almost tempted to use the word evolution, but, uh, but that's what we're moving to. Oh, quit looking at your watch, young lady. <laughs> Normally I preach this long, so you should all just be grateful. This was all for free. Um, it's Labor Day. Um, go and have a good lunch fortify your hearts for the abomination that brings desolation as we lose to Calgary one more time. But, uh, oh, I know, oh, ye of little faith, but let's, let's be honest, the only team we can beat are the BC Lions. Um, next couple weeks, it said in the bulletin that the coffee is canceled. Is that right, Sally? That's correct. Is there, can I put you on the spot? Is there any way we can have a spontaneous coffee? Just coffee, coffee. Nothing major. Never mind. I'm sorry I asked. Well, maybe. Who knows, right? We'll see. Okay. Shut up, Norm. Um, everybody, everybody have a great day. We'll, uh, we'll see you in seven or less. Be blessed and uh, 